I've always been familiar with the Flash, but I never really knew what the Scarlet Speedster could do until I started getting deeper and deeper into comic books and DC lore. Turns out, the dude can travel through the Speed Force. This idea of time travel is taken to the next level with Flash's super move in Injustice 2. The Flash grabs his opponent, phases into the Speed Force, smashes them into various historical objects, and then finally into a past version of themselves just before the Flash grabs them and takes them into the Speed Force. After Flash's insane Injustice 1 super move, I didn't think Netherrealm could top it. Needless to say, I think they did. Set pieces are a staple of Call of Duty campaigns. From the nuke in Modern Warfare to the Future Club in Black Ops 2, they've made the series synonymous with over-the-top action moments. These set pieces have grown somewhat stale over the years, since we as the audience have grown to expect them. This, though, I don't think anyone could have expected something like this. This set piece is so insanely over-the-top, I'm not sure if I should laugh or be completely in awe. Either way, my mouth was agape at the scale of just how insane this moment is. Words really don't do it justice. Shit, did that just happen? By the time the curtain fell on Destiny 1, there were four raids. Each one proved to be a Herculean task, requiring military precision in both communication and skill. Destiny 2's first raid, Leviathan, would prove no different. My fire team attempted the raid completely blind and made it all the way to the throne room before taking a long break after 13 hours. A few days later, I finally emerged from the Leviathan victorious. Completing a raid is an incredible feeling, and victory is even sweeter when you've figured it out blind with five other people. I don't think I'll ever let that go in my entire life. Got it. Yes! Yes, we did it! Drain key. The train is one of the most memorable set pieces in not only Uncharted 2, but the entire Uncharted franchise. Same goes for the 4x4 sections in Uncharted 4. Listening to the behind the scenes for the creation of both of these moments showed me just how difficult it is to make impressive set pieces. So imagine my surprise upon the discovery that the final chapter of Uncharted The Lost Legacy was two of the best set pieces in the franchise combined. Jumping from train car to 4x4 and back while progressing forward, culminating into a cinematic fistfight, it served as an excellent callback to prior Uncharted games, while proving that even without the direction of Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley, Naughty Dog is unparalleled when it comes to action. You think you've won? More will rise up. But the young king, you have achieved nothing. It's like you said. Progress. Demand sacrifice. I told myself remasters would not apply to the overall game of the year list, but for top 10 video game moments, I couldn't resist including a blast from my past. Crash Bandicoot Warped was a game that highlighted the very early years of my gaming career, and being able to relive the past with some flashy new graphics and a redone soundtrack felt like returning home after a long hiatus. It's still just as fun as I remember it being. I had a smile on my face every second I played the remaster. Levels once forgotten felt familiar once again, and the jumps and spins felt like second nature. It's pure happiness. It's Crash Bandicoot
Super Mario Odyssey is a game rooted in nostalgia. From the very beginning, the message is clear. This is going to be a sandbox Mario game like Super Mario 64. If that wasn't apparent, the game also features 8-bit side-scrolling sections, harkening back to Super Mario Bros. on NES. The marriage of this idea and the concept of New Donk City never really dawned on me until the festival, where not only is Mario followed by a sensational soundtrack, a replica of his first appearance is fully playable. The entire festival is a complete burst of happiness, from both the music and nostalgia creating one of the most emotionally charged moments of the year. Usually when people talk about emotional moments, it'll be a character death or some other sad moment. Odyssey matches that emotion, but on the completely opposite side of the spectrum. Upon hearing Igor's voice for the first time in Persona 5, many fans were disappointed it didn't sound like the Igor we knew and loved from the previous Persona games. It was an interesting new take for the character, with a deep, menacing voice rather than a light, almost playful voice. Many saw it as a different take for the character for Persona 5 and didn't really look into it any further. This was the perfect setup for a twist, something so obvious yet something nobody really assumed. Turns out there's a reason behind Igor's voice change, because it wasn't Igor at all, it was an imposter. So when the real Igor reveals himself with the more familiar sounding voice, everything just feels right. Not only was it a good twist, it was expertly done, because no one saw it coming. Master. Oh. oh my. It's been quite a while since I last stepped foot in this place. Welcome to the Velvet Room. My name is Igor. I am pleased to make your acquaintance. Wandering through the open world of Horizon Zero Dawn, I couldn't help but ask myself a few times, how did humans survive the machine onslaught? The game gives subtle hints in a story mission at a Project Zero Dawn, but not many details are given other than the fact it was a project created in the event of catastrophe. The lid gets blown wide open upon the discovery of a secret base, which discovered that the human race actually did not survive the apocalypse. Instead, human cells were kept in secret bases all over the United States, and would only be rebirthed once Earth had been terraformed back into a hospitable planet. It goes way deeper than that, but it was a fascinating look into a potential doomsday scenario, and how the human race managed to survive despite dying with the planet. It's not an impossible dream. It is within our grasp if we work tirelessly and stop at nothing to achieve it. We can't stop life from ending. But if you will help me, help Gaia, we can give it a future. Join me and help make that future real. At this point, killing the protagonist and fake out deaths are pretty cliche. I had an internal dialogue as this scene was playing out. Are they really going there? Are they really killing BJ? Who's gonna take over anyway? The seeds of this moment were planted early, but it still didn't take away from the shock of the moment. It was not only shocking, but it marked a turning point in the game's tone. BJ was no longer spouting poetry about his failing body. He's now in full Nazi killing mode. Yes! Survive! Genius, Shad, did I ever tell you that? Sit. He's on. Max is right. You should get out of here. The man ready for transport? The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is my favorite game of all time. Dragon Roost Island is one of the most famous places in the entire series, featuring one of the series' most iconic tracks as the island's theme. As my favorite game in the series, it's only natural for me to form attachments to the music of Wind Waker. When I approached Rito Village in Breath of the Wild, I didn't really know what to expect. Instead of making their home on an active volcano, the Rito chose to roost in the cold northwest of Hyrule. Upon entrance, I was a little disappointed because I couldn't recognize the trademark theme, until the music swells up, and a burst of emotion so pure rose from within my heart, I couldn't help but just sit still and enjoy the sights and sounds, as tears welled up in my eyes. 
I don't know if there's an afterlife, but if there is, I hope it's basically just Rito Village. Mm -hmm.